A continuation of the conversion of Thomas Halliburton, 1674 to 1712. I am narrating this on Christmas Day, 2017, which happens to be his 343rd birthday. Containing an account of the outgate I got about the close of January 1698, in a state of manners thereon. If this extremity had lasted much longer, my soul had sunk under the weight of it, and even while I was in this case would have ruined me if the Lord had not secretly supported in times of the greatest extremity, and as it were, held me by the hand even while I carried myself most wickedly. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, thou hast holden me by my right hand. And at this extremity the Lord stepped in. When I destroyed myself, he let me see help in him. He found me lying, wallowing in my blood, Ezekiel 16.6, in a helpless and hopeless condition. I had none that would or could save me. I was forsaken of all my lovers. I was caught in the thicket. I was quite overcome. Neither was I in case to fight or flee. And then the Lord passed by me, cast his skirt over me, and made this time a time of love. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Genesis 22:14. I cannot be very positive about the day or hour of this deliverance, nor can I satisfy many other questions about the way and manner of it. But this is of no consequence if the work is in substance sound, for the wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it comes and where it goes, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. John 3.8 Many things about the way and manner we may be ignorant of, while we are sufficiently sure of the effects. As to these things I must say with a blind man I know not, one thing I know that whereas I was blind now I see, John 9.25. However, it was toward the close of January, or the beginning of February 1698, that the seasonable relief came. And so far as I can remember, I was at secret prayer in very great extremity, not far from despair, when the Lord seasonably stepped in and gave this merciful turn to affairs. When I said, My foot slips, thy mercy held me up. And when there was none to save, then his own arm brought salvation. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, shined into my mind to give the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That which yielded me this relief was the discovery of the Lord as manifested in the word. He said to me, Thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. Hosea 13.9 now the Lord discovered in the manner afterwards to be mentioned several things which I shall here take notice of. He let me see that there is forgiveness with him that he may show mercy. There is mercy and plenteous redemption. He made all his goodness pass before me, and he proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity, transgression and sin. Who will be gracious to whom he will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom he will show mercy. This is a strange sight to one who before looked on God only as a consuming fire, which I could not see and live. He brought me from Sinai and at thunderings to Mount Zion, and to the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that cleanses from all sin and speaks better things than the blood of Abel. He revealed Christ in his glory. I now as wonder beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I was hereon made to say, You are fairer than the sons of men. Hereon he let me see that he who had before rejected all that I could offer was well pleased in the beloved. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Mine ears have you opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings have you not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. And hereby I was further fully satisfied that not only there was forgiveness of sins and justification by free grace, through the redemption that is in Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. But moreover, I saw with wonder and delight in some measure how God by this means might be just and justifying even the ungodly who believe in Jesus. How was I ravished with delight when made to see that the God in whom a little before I thought there was no hope for me, 
or any sinner in my case, if there were any such, notwithstanding his spotless purity, his deep hatred of sin, his inflexible justice and righteousness, and his untainted faithfulness, pledged in the threatening of the law, might not only pardon but without prejudice to his justice or other attributes, be just in justifying even the ungodly. The reconciliation of those seemingly inconsistent attributes with one another and with the salvation of sinners quite surprised and astonished me. The Lord further opened the gospel to me and let me see that to me, even to me, was the word of this salvation sent. All this is offered to me, and I was invited secretly to come and take the water of life freely. Revelation 22:17, And to come in my distress unto this blessed rest. Come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and ye shall find rest for your souls. He, to my great satisfaction, gave me a pleasant discovery of his design in the whole, that it was that no flesh might glory in his sight, but that he who glories should have occasion only to glory in the Lord. The Lord revealed to my soul that full and suitable provision made in this way against the power of sin, that as there is righteousness in him, so there is strength, even everlasting strength in the Lord Jehovah to secure against all enemies and that in him there is sweet provision made against the guilt of sins, that through the power of temptation his people may be inveigled in too. These things write I unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When this strange discovery was made of a relief, in which full provision was made for all the concerns of God's glory, and my salvation and subordination to it, my soul was by a glorious and sweet power carried out to rest in it, as worthy of God in every way suitable and satisfying in my case. They that know his name will put their trust in him. All these discoveries were conveyed to me only by the word. It was not indeed by one particular testimony or promise of the word, but by the concurring light of a great many of the promises and testimonies of the word, seasonably set home and most plainly expressing the truths above mentioned. The promises and truths of the word in great abundance and variety were brought to remembrance, and the wonders contained in them were set before mine eyes in the light of the word. He sent his word and healed me. Psalm 112, verse 20. This is a rod of his strength that made me willing. Psalm 110, 2 and 3. And it was a plain word of salvation that I found to be the power of God. Romans 1, 16. I cannot positively say that the particular places above mentioned were the words in which these discoveries were conveyed to my soul, but by these are such like passages, and I believe by many even of those mentioned promises and truths, were the discoveries above named made to me. But it was not the word alone that conveyed the discovery, for most of the passages in which I was relieved I had formerly in my distresses read and thought upon, without finding any relief in them. But now the Lord shined into my mind by them, Second Corinthians 4, 6. Formerly I was only acquainted with a letter which doesn't profit, but now the Lord's words were spirit and life. And in his light I saw light, God opening mine eyes to see wonders out of his law. Psalm 119.18 There was light in them, a burning light by them, shone into my mind to give me not merely some theoretical knowledge, but the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.6 in many differences I found between the discoveries now made and the notions I formerly entertained of the same truths. It was true light, giving true manifestations of God, even the one true God and the one mediator between God and man, and given a true view of my state with respect to God, not according to the foolish conceits I had formerly entertained, but as they are represented in the Word. It was a pleasant and sweet light. Truly light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. It had a heavenly satisfaction in God attending it. It led to a pleasure in the fountain whence it came. It was a distinct and clear light, representing not only spiritual things, but manifesting them in their glory and in their comely order. Second Corinthians 4, 6. It put all things in their due line of subordination to God and gave distinct and sweet views of their genuine tendency. Number 5. It was a satisfying light. The soul rested in the discoveries it made and was satisfied. 
It could not doubt if it saw or if the things were so as it represented them. It was a quickening, refreshing, healing light. It was a powerful light. It dissipated that thick darkness that overspread my mind and made all those frightful temptations that had formerly disturbed me fly before it. When the Lord arose, his enemies were scattered and fled before his face. The first discernible effect of this discovery was an approbation of God's way of saving sinners by Jesus Christ to the praise of the glory of his grace, which I take to be the true scriptural notion of justifying faith. For this not only answers the scripture descriptions of it, by receiving, coming to him, looking to him, trusting and believing in him, but it really gives him that glory that he designed by all this contrivance, the glory of his wisdom, grace, and mercy, and truth. Now this discovery of the Lord's name brought me to trust in him and glory only in the Lord. I found my soul fully satisfied in these discoveries as pointing out a way of relief altogether, and in all respects suitable to the need of a poor, guilty, self-condemned, self-destroyed sinner, beaten from all other reliefs, and who has his mouth stopped before God after he has spent all his substance to no purpose upon other physicians. In this I rested as a way full of peace, comfort, security, and satisfaction, is providing abundantly for all those ends I desire to have secured. And this approbation was not merely for a fit, but ever after in all temptations it discovered itself, by keeping me up in a fixed assent and adherence of mind to and persuasion of this truth, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is only in his Son. When afterwards I was under temptation, solicited to go away and seek relief in other ways, it still kept me constant in a firm, resolute rejection of all other ways of relief and renunciation of all proposals that led to them, even when I found not the present comfort of this way. I ever held at that with Ephraim. What have I any more to do with idols? Chapter 4, containing an account of my strugglings with and dwelling sin, its victories, the causes of them on my part, and God's goodness with respect to this trial. I had not long been in this pleasant case before I found my mistake, that enemies were not foiled, and that I must down into the valley and wrestle with principalities and powers, and fight no less enemies than the Anakims, my corruption, self, passion, and so on, and especially those sins which easily beset me, Hebrews 12, 1, which formerly I was so careful to have spared, and which I refused to deliver up to justice set upon me, and finding that I was now no more theirs as formerly, they gave me frequent foils. I fell before them often in multiplied relapses. When I would do good, evil was present with me, and the good I would do through their power I did not, and the evil I would not do that I did. So I learned that the difference between the Lord's people and others is not simply in this, that the one falls and the other stands, but there is a difference in the issue. The just man falls seven times a day, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Now, though I was unwilling to fight, I drew to armor upon the appearance of these enemies, who received great advantage by that security in which I had fallen. And before ever I was aware there received a great advantage I could not easily get from them again. But however, since fight I must, I tried what weapons would be most successful. And I objected to them that now I had no more to do with them. I had engaged with the Lord." I essayed to reason against them as Joseph did, but without his faith. Shall I do this great evil and sin against God? When my indwelling sin still persisted, I essayed to flee from them and avoid the occasions of them, but the enemy was in my bosom. I prayed against them that the Lord would rebuke them. I complained of them as his enemies. I protested against them in many other ways did I try. But after all, they persisted, and I was often foiled, and hereon I fell into grievous discouragements. And I began to doubt if I was sincere or if the Lord was really with me. If the Lord be with us, why is all this evil come upon us? Judges 6.13 I began to doubt of the issue and conclude I should one day perish by their hand. My conscience being defiled, I was damned and could not look up to God. And upon the whole, I was in very great distress, often at giving over. Though I often searched at the time, I could not discover whence it was that I fell, for no mean that I thought of then, almost I left unassayed. But since several reasons of the prevalence of sin and the unsuccessfulness of my attempts against it has the Lord graciously discovered, though I am far
far from thinking to hit them all or pretending to remember even all that the Lord has discovered, yet some of them I shall mention that now occur. First, I was in the entry of this warfare too confident in grace already received, laid too much stress on it and promised too much on my own hand, like Peter in Matthew 26.33, and no wonder I met with his fate and was left to make discoveries of my own weakness. Number two, the subtle enemies I had to do with took me between the straits, and I was not watchful against nor aware of the seasons when they had special advantage. The thief knew his time when the good man is from home and all is quiet, and I did not watch, and therefore he came in an hour when I didn't look for him. Mine enemies put me upon vain work where the sin lay, not in the thing itself, but in the degree of it. There are my subtle enemies put me on to appear against and seek to eradicate what was really in itself lawful. Of this I had many instances with respect to passions and worldly employments and converse with sinful people. I didn't mind that if we were bound altogether up from converse with the idolaters, fornicators, and so on of this world. We must needs go out of the world. And as there was an anger to be avoided, so there was an anger that was allowable and even duty required that we should be angry, but so as to avoid sin. So Satan tempted me to provoke God by aiming at things which were neither given of God, nor had I any reason to expect them, and thus to tempt God by seeking stones to be made bread, or things not meet to be done. Like the Stoics, I was not content to have the passions kept in their own order, but would have them eradicated. So the devil drives to extremes, and when we fell of success, he takes thence occasion to discourage us. Again, number four. I still neglected some means of God's appointment under pretense of inconveniences and difficulties, and sometimes because irksome to the flesh, in which these were oft times the only proper means that were omitted, or at least a principle in that case. The omission of one thing ruins much, and our apologies and excuses will not do. Some particular sins require particular remedies. When God has appointed the use of these, and this is omitted, no wonder all others fail. When the disciples asked wherefore they could not cast a devil out, our Lord told them there were some kinds that went not out but by prayer and fasting. Whenever any means is appointed by God, when the case occurs in which it is requisite, the remedy of God's appointment must be used if we would reach the end. If there are supposed or real difficulties, yet while these difficulties are not our sin, we have reason to trust him as to these and try the means. I was often slothful, and by drowsiness a man is closed with rags, Proverbs 23:21. and enemies may easily sow tears when men are asleep. Above all, I was little acquainted with the way of faith and improvement of Christ for sanctification, and a trade with the throne of grace for supplies to help in time of need. I was sometimes not single in my aims. I designed to have a victory that would ease me of the trouble of watchfulness. I was weary of a fighting life, and would have been at ease, and had too much of an eye unto this, and such like aims. And be like, if I had got leave to rest, I should have been too proud of my success. Thus we ask and receive not, because we ask amiss to consume it on our lusts. When I was not presently heard, I did not persevere in prayer for the supplies of grace that I sought. So I found often that so long as I was with the Lord, he was with me. Second Chronicles 15.2 They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Isaiah 40.31 But I was too soon over with it, and from these and the like causes did my lack of success proceed. Yet notwithstanding all these dreadful miscarriages on my part, the Lord in the heat of this conflict, and even while... I was many ways faulty, was very kind. He kept me from giving quite over, though I fell. Yet I was not quite cast down. Psalm 37:24. When I had many times gone furthest with temptation, yet he came in with seasonable help. And passing all my miscarriages, he helped me up. Let me see that he kept me from being quite overcome and gave me some assurances for the future. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast beholden me by my right hand. Thou wilt guide me by thy counsel and receive me to glory. 
I had gracious experiences of the Lord's helping in the time of need and hearing cries. The Lord sometimes stepped in when I was overcome and sent, as it were, Abigail to keep me from executing my wicked purposes. 1 Samuel 25:32. Sometimes he gave me a clean victory and strengthened me to repel temptations in many other ways did he help and deliver. He sometimes, and even very frequently, when I was hard put to it, cleared up my sincerity and gave me such views of it as emboldened me to appeal to him, which freed me of that temptation and left me at liberty under advantage of this new encouragement to oppose more vigorously. Do not I hate all them that hate thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Psalm 139, 21 and 22. And by this I was not emboldened to sin. I dare not take encouragement to sin because grace abounded, though motions were made this way by my naughty heart. But I was made more afraid of offending. These and many other ways was the Lord kind in the conflict. He frequently said to me, Don't be afraid. Surely there is an end, and your expectation shall not be cut off. The Lord has since let me see what gracious designs he carried on by this trial, and what need there was of it in order both to his glory and my good. By this he taught me the nature of that state we are here in, that it is a wilderness, a warfare, and that we must be soldiers if we mean to be Christians. He taught me by this that the grace that is sufficient for us is not in our own hand, but in the Lord, Second Corinthians 12.9. And that therefore our security with respect to future temptations is not in grace already received, but in this, that there is enough in the promise and the way patent to the throne of grace for it. He taught me that God is a sovereign disposer and gives out as he sees meet in time of need his own grace, and he is the only judge of the proper season of giving it out. He led me by this to discern somewhat more of the covenant of grace, that in it there are no promises made of absolute freedom from sin while we are here. If any man say he has no sin, he is a liar, and that we have no promise of freedom from gross sins and those sins in which you have been formally entangled, but in the use and diligent use of the means of the Lord's appointment. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hereby he taught me that great lesson that when I am weak in myself, then I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. When I was diffident of myself, I was then always victorious, or at least came off without hazard, which is very far different from what men generally think that when a man is diffident and distrusts himself, that then he is not meet for managing any undertaking, and this is indeed true when he is carnally diffident. But where there is a distrust of self with an eye to the Lord, it is very far otherwise. By this he taught me the use and necessity and glory of that provision that is made by the covenant of grace for guilt. It writes all to us to dissuade from and strengthen us against sin. Let's us see an advocate with a father and blood that cleanses from all sin, First John 2, 1. He let me see his holy jealousy and how displeased he was with me for my cleaving to sin so long and sinful forbearance, because I would not slay them as the Lord appointed me. And when he required it, therefore he left them like the nations of Canaan to tempt and try me. The sins that now molested me and frequently cast me down were those that I sought to spare before. God cried often to me to part with them, and I would not hear, and now God would not hear when I cried to be rid of them. Thou wast a God that forgavest their iniquities, but thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. The Lord by this humbled and proved, and let me see what was in my heart, even a great deal more of wickedness than I suspected. The Lord by this instructed me that this is not my rest, Micah 2.10, and made me value heaven more than any otherwise I would have done. By this he discovered the riches and extent of that forgiveness that is with him, that it reaches to iniquity, transgression, and sin, that is, sins of all sorts, multiplied relapses not accepted. He that requires us to forgive to seventy times seven in a day will not do less. Yea, he tells us that in this respect his thoughts are as far above ours as the heavens are above the earth. And finally, the Lord by this fitted me to compassionate others who are tempted and comfort them. So I was made a gainer by my losses and falls to the praise of his grace. 
After some years struggling, the Lord made me lay by all prejudices against proper means, and wait on him in the use of them all, with some eye to him, and then he gave me in some measure of victory. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. First Corinthians 15, verse 57.